Welcome to Get It Done Entrepreneurs, where we talk with founders of companies who bet on themselves in one. My name is Rich Lebrun, and I am the founder and CEO of Lebrun Advisory Group. You can find us at rlebrun.com. Our mission is to help our clients build wealth through business ownership. Stick around to the end of the show and we'll reveal how you can be our next guest. With that, let me jump in and introduce you to our special guest, Danny Fornell. He's the founder of International Directional Drilling. He's a decisive executive with serial success, launching and growing high-performing global enterprises in the industrial energy sector. He's devoted to business outcomes through team achievement, keenly inclusive of international diversity that prepares and aligns talent with strategic needs for sustainable growth. Intrepid and assured pioneer in spirit and action, always prepared to lead into uncharted territory and galvanize others for organizational units. Danny lives in Fort Lauderdale, Florida with his family. And with that said, welcome, Danny. Thank you for the introduction, Rich. I appreciate it. Yeah, you know, I love the fact that I say we're going to have a wide range of topics, and this is going to be one that most of our listeners are not going to be very familiar with in this directional boring in, in the, uh, that you do, uh, which we'll talk about in the middle of the pro- program of exactly what your company does. But but for right now, and to start out, because you and I have known each other for a couple of years, we met a couple of years ago in COVID, you know, and we were talking about being you know, our own boss and starting a business and, you know, uh, taking that path. And then you told me you're starting your company. And so I'd love to hear that, or have our listeners hear that story, some of the thought process you were going to, some maybe the things that, you know, were positive, maybe some fears, some uh, excitement, some challenges. But ultimately, you t- went all in, bet on yourself, and here you are, very successful. Thank you very much for that introduction, Rich. And uh, yeah, it's my pleasure to be on your podcast. I appreciate the opportunity to talk. And uh, I I always enjoy sharing my story. Um, Some people may find it more interesting than others, but uh, I'm very blessed. You know, I was uh, very fortunate at a young age to give, have the opportunity to move overseas. Um, When I was 20 years old, I moved uh, into the Middle East. And uh, from from the start, basically, I was given an opportunity uh, to take on, I would say, quite a challenging role in that I was asked uh, from an English component manufacturer to set up a branch office for them in Dubai. So there was a lot of responsibility. It was the first time I had ever been outside of Canada, um, but I took on the opportunity to you know, see how far I could take it. And I ended up spending almost 30 years of my professional career in the Middle East, uh, working for 26 years with the same company, which is a Austrian uh, multinational. And I was very fortunate throughout those 26 years to have a a very successful career. I was able to launch several locations throughout the Middle East in Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, uh, the United Arab Emirates, Algeria, Libya, Nigeria. Um, So really, from a very young age, I was able to develop that entrepreneurial mindset and, you know, how to get things done. You know, working in a challenging environment as the Middle East is, it wasn't easy. Uh, There was definitely a lot of hurdles to overcome, language barriers, religious barriers. Obviously, we know that uh, many of those countries have their own political issues and so on and so forth. But I was able to do it uh, and I was able to maintain a fairly good level of success throughout those 26 years that I was living over there. With all that said, uh, the company offered me an opportunity uh, to relocate from Dubai and take over their operations here in North America, um, which I was uh, honestly speaking a little bit reluctant. Um, I did love uh, our life, uh, married with two kids there in the Middle East. It was a very gifted life. You know, we had a lot of opportunity to travel throughout the region um, and live quite a high standard of living. But having the opportunity to relocate to the United States, both my children uh, were young teenagers at the time. And we felt it was the right time to, you know, relocate and get back into reality, uh, you know, allow our children to be challenged in, in uh, you know, a very challenging education system, which I believe the U.S. is, uh, and also for the opportunity, you know, and we found as we did relocate on the private side, um, both our kids, they really did excel. You know, they got into the 
American culture. Um, obviously, there were native English speakers anyways, but still they had an opportunity to learn a new system, you know, obviously be acquainted with a different culture than the Middle East is. And they both continue to excel every day. So the decision for us on a family perspective to relocate was a very rewarding one and continues to be to this day. Um, on the professional side, uh, taking over uh, the operations for the, well, taking over the leadership role for the North American organization, which at that time was struggling. We had uh, several areas that were in a loss making situation. Um, there was a lot of lack of uh, process and controls and regulations in the business. And that was my challenge. That's why I was asked to come and do the job because I had a track record of being able to turn around and, and start new enterprise. And uh, it was fun. You know, it started in 2017, uh, made a lot of changes and uh, enjoyed the traveling throughout North America, completely different environment than the Middle East. Um, made a lot of friends, made a lot of, you know, business partners, acquaintances that were doing a variety of different things. Some were running corporations, uh, which was always interesting for me to learn from the corporate American perspective, but also many very successful entrepreneurs running their own business. So it kind of set the seed, you know, I, I was at the time approaching 50 years of age, worked, you know, for almost 30 years in a corporate environment, you know, having process and procedure, reporting requirements, and always having a boss. And in corporate America, you tend to have multiple bosses. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a challenge. Uh, you know, there's no doubt that it, it's a challenge having to report to multiple people and reporting and process that you may find either redundant or irrelevant. But anyways, that's, that's what corporate America is today. So um, I started to prospect and think, you know, is this something I want to do for the rest of my productive years, whether it's 15, 20 years, or do I want to challenge myself and take the opportunity to explore what opportunities are out there for, you know, for starting a new business. And uh, at that point, I was very fortunate to meet Rich. And uh, I really appreciated all those discussions that we had in the beginning. Um, and obviously, you helping us, you know, look through various opportunities through franchise, so on and so forth. And I, I got excited. There's no doubt, you know, and America being the land of opportunity, you can really see that if you have the right sauce, you can be successful. You know, it doesn't come easy. Everything comes with a lot of risk. Uh, but if you're willing to put your back into it and do some hard work, you can build a successful company. So with that said, unfortunately for Rich, we never did go down the franchise <laughs> road. Um, I, I started to look at you know, my skill sets and, you know, things that I'm passionate about. And I have a very mechanical mind, an engineering mind. And all of my career in the past had been in the oil and gas sector, um, which I learned a lot. I learned a lot how to be productive in that environment with all of the prerequisites, you know, dealing with multinational oil and gas companies. There's a certain standard that you have to comply with. Um, to be able to get in the front door and you either do or you don't. So I had all of that experience. I had all of the, that knowledge in my toolbox. So aside from looking at, you know, setting up a, a restaurant or a doggy daycare or uh, oil change stop, I said, why don't I use that knowledge and experience and see what other opportunities are out there that I can explore on my own and, and possibly set up my own company. I love, I love the story. And you know what? You, you know, I, we've talked a lot, had a lot of great conversations, and you, you, know, you, you hit your goal regardless, whether it was a franchise or not. The goal was to become your own boss, take control of your destiny. And for our listeners, by the way, there's only three choices out there anyhow. Either you start your own, you buy a business that's a franchise, you buy a business that's not. So uh, Danny went on to start his own, which is fantastic. Danny, looking back, I'm sure it's only been a couple of years, but you're, you have a lot of wealth of wisdom and, and expertise. Is there anything that you would look back and say uh, regarding the business you started that you would do differently? Well, definitely. There, there's definitely been, it's been, uh, there's been a long learning curve. There's no doubt. There's been, in this industry in particular that we're in, which all, with all new business, there's challenges. Uh, and ours didn't come without those challenges. One of the biggest hurdles with getting into your own business is that nobody wants to know you. You're starting a business. No bank wants to talk to you. No investment company wants to know you. Um, everybody pushes you away. Your customers, 
they don't want to speak to you because you have no experience, which was for me a big slap in the face because I'm coming out of a corporation and a company that had been very successful. Um, and I had, you know, banks lining up at the door to come and offer us money. We had investors constantly contacting us to buy the company. Um, so it was it was a bit of a shock, you know, and I I always felt I was, you know, quite comfortable at selling myself and selling my my prospects. And we were able to do that, but it was a challenge. It was really a challenge. So I would say that was a, a real wake up call that uh, in corporate America, until you get your two years under your belt, you really nobody wants to know your name. So that was that was one thing. Um, and, and just in general, uh, accessibility to capital. So, you know, it's funny how fast money goes and when you're not earning it and coming out of, again, a corporate environment where you tend to have, you know, lines of credits and, you know, deep pockets and cash pool. And so money was never an issue. If I had an idea to set up a branch or a manufacturing somewhere and I was able to sell the concept, the money just followed. Whereas now, you know, I, I had the, I did a lot of homework in the beginning to understand the industry that I was moving into, you know, prospecting what's going to be a game changer for us, what USPs we need. So everybody that I proposed the idea to, you could see that they also got as excited as I was about the opportunity. But when it came down to putting, you know, putting dollars on the table, everybody was like, it's not going to work. So I had to make the decision early on that I was going to self-fund the startup, um, take my own cash reserves. And that's where really, when you say betting on yourself, that's when, that's when it really counts. You know that, uh, you know, you're, you've got your own money on the line and it's, you know, do or die. So that was quite, uh, quite a challenge. I love it. Thank you for that. Exactly right. That's, that's why I call betting on yourself and then you get to go in or not. Um, on the flip side, you've been got a couple of years under your belt. I know you've been very, you've been successful, not without challenges. But is there any decisions that you made that was key that would help catalyze your uh, success? The, the number one thing that we that we did when we started IDD is we didn't jump in blindly. You know, I, I set certain goals as prerequisites. I knew that by doing our homework, there was a certain element to this business that lacked process, that lacked procedure, that lacked discipline. And still the industry is full of it today. And I said, no, we're not gonna do that. Before we start engaging customers, before we come to the door with this is what we can do, we're gonna be able to do it and we're gonna be able to do it well. That's a lesson that I learned in the Middle East as well. You know, trying to prospect for business. If you do your homework well, and you know that you have an audience that are willing, that are able to buy your product. Well, you have to bet on yourself at that point and say, okay, I'm not going to start prospecting business and then underperform. I need to be ready from day one. When I knock on my customer's door and I ask for their trust to do business with them, I want to be able to commit 100% to do that business. And that's really what we did with IDD. So when we set up the company, it took us five months until we were actually I till I was confident to go and start knocking on customers' doors until I was sure that we had the right branding, the right process in place to ensure that our employees would be safe doing the work that we're doing because there's a high risk in what we do. I was, wanted to make sure that we were able to provide the customer with the right level of communication, documentation, and process control so that they were fully comfortable that what we were doing for them we were doing it right and we had transparency in the way we were doing it so that they could from day one have a certain level of confidence and trust. And really that's been the catalyst for our business and for why we're a young company, but today we're very successful and we're already a top tier service provider because from day one, we were able to knock on, you know, tier two, tier one and prime customers and offer our services. And they accepted our services, understanding that, we were transparent, we had process, procedure in place, and we were going to do it safe. So that was really a game changer for us. Where we see today, a lot of our competitors are, are challenged to come into the market. They're going in as third and fourth tier suppliers. They're calling up us now, asking to us to sub out work to them, which of course, you're only getting a small portion of the pie when you're doing that. We were able to go right to tier one, 
take the bigger portion of the pie, which helped us to catalyze the business and to keep us growing. Fantastic. You know, there's a lot of schools of thought in business, especially when it comes to launching something new and I'll call it the R&D side before you actually come to, to fruition. Some say, you know, put the product out early, let the customer help you mold and shape it, make some errors. Uh, and some say, you know, I want to stay in R&D longer and make sure when they come out of the gates, the product, get, the customer gets a more well-fine-tuned machine. And that's the route that you would took. Okay, I want to take a little commercial break. International directional drilling, you've explained to me what it is, but I imagine most of my listeners really, if you ask them, what is directional drilling? They probably see it, probably walk over it every day, but they really don't know what it is. So if you wouldn't mind, tell us exactly what your company does and who your customers are. All right, so as Rich has explained, we're in the directional drilling business. So, so basically, we do what we call underground construction. And our role every day is putting plastic conduits, pipes. There's so many, everybody has a different name for it, but we basically put plastic pipes in the ground. So we do it through a directionally drilled method, which means that we drill below the surface and just at a certain depth. So each utility provider, um, they have a required minimum depth. So they'll say, we need our conduit to be at 30, minimum 36 inches. You can go as deep as you want, but minimum 36 inches. So we open up what we call a bore pit. We put a drill head in the ground and we start drilling. And we have what we call a locator. So each drill crew has two people, one person operating the drill and one person managing the locator. And the locator is basically following the head of the drill and communicating back to the driller to tell him where the head is in the ground. And by directional drilling, you can then move the head in various direction to avoid already underground utilities. So mm -hmm. there's a variety of things in ground, power, water, sewer, gas, uh, storm drains that are already placed underground. And of course, we're bringing in new conduit into that environment. We need to make sure that we don't hit anything. So we follow a directional method to drill through the space. Um, and then we come out at our destination. At our destination, we basically connect on to a reel of, of plastic pipe. And then we simply pull that pipe back into the ground through the bore up to the other side. And that's basically what our role in, in this industry is doing. And we leave that pipe above ground on both ends which now allows our customers to come back and put whatever they want to put in that pipe. And there's a, like I said, there's a variety of, of uh, utilities that can be put inside that pipe. Now, is there, are there cameras uh, attached to the drill itself or uh, to technology x-rays you can see through the ground? What's, there is it, no, it's actually, it's, it, what's, what's in the drill head is what's called a sond. And that sond communicates through wavelengths to the locator. And it's basically communicating back to the driller the depth of where that head is. So there's the, not the, the person who's doing the locating is constantly communicating back to the driller, telling him, oh, you're at a certain depth. You need to go deeper. You need to come higher. And you're always following the bore path. So you basically prepare yourself to shoot in a certain direction and you can curve it, you can pitch down, pitch up, depending on what you need to avoid. And that's basically how you follow, you follow your bore path. There's no cameras, there's no, you know, uh, having a wire attached to it. It's really just through a frequency that uh, you're communicating with the drill head. And then the driller, obviously with the experience, they know how to run the drill and they can then control the movement of that drill underground to avoid any utilities that are there. Because yeah, there's a lot of, like you said, there's a lot of things underground. Okay, so now I want to switch back to the second half of our interview. Um, you and I talked, you, you started your business in COVID, or just after COVID. I remember that you, met, you and I were talking about the, you know, the supply chain. You're trying to find trucks, if I remember correctly. And so you were in the heart of that supply chain shortage. Here we are a couple of years later, you know, we're 2022, we still have some remnants of supply chain. We've got, now we've got labor issues, we got high interest rates, we got other things, a world war going on, or wars going on, hopefully not world war, okay, political unrest, et cetera. 
And then we have a storm like Hurricane Ian in Florida. So uh, I'm going to throw all that on the table. We're going to kind of sort through it in pieces. But question for, you know, for our listeners is, you're an owner, you're a CEO, you, you're facing the same head, headwinds everybody else is. How are you navigating that? How are you leading your team, the charge? Are you innovating? Are you adapting? Are you retreating? Are you investing more? What's some of the mindset that's going on with you? So, and again, the cycle of, you know, cycle of COVID, et cetera, et cetera. It's quite interesting, you know, how we follow the dynamic because we were at one point, we were at, uh, let's start that again so we can cut that out. Yeah. Yeah. We'll edit that out. Okay. Go ahead. Let him finish in there because he's going to go back out the other way. Yeah. All right. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause. Our... Okay. Go ahead. Right. So, yeah, it kind of it's kind of come full circle, you know, starting the business in COVID, there's no doubt that we were very challenged to find all of the resources we needed to establish the business. We couldn't find equipment. So directional drills, all of the various equipment that goes with a directional drill, we had to buy secondhand equipment, we had to buy equipment at auction, just to be able to have the basic equipment to be able to start directional drilling big challenge. Second challenge was the people. It was impossible to find people. You know, we're working in an outdoor environment. We have a lot of laborers working with us, as well as professionals. And because of the COVID situation with all of the government subsidies and whatnot, it was very challenging to find people. You know, we, we had to, at some point, we were bringing in crews from Colorado. We were bringing in crews from North Carolina to come and drill for us because we simply could not find local South Floridians that uh, were available and willing to come to come and work for us. So no, that, there was a lot of challenges in the early days. And of course, being an unknown, we did, really needed to sell ourselves to our employee base to say, hey, you know, we are a decent company and we do want to do right by you. So there's a lot of question mark, you know, is this company going to survive? If, you know, what is, how are they going to be treating us and whatnot? Um, and over time, obviously, we built up our reputation. Um, and things with COVID started to settle down. But still today, we're not facing the same issues. We're facing different issues. Now, the pipeline of employees is solid. We have now people coming to us on a regular basis. We have the experience. We have the notification in the market that, you know, we're a decent company, good company to work for. So the manpower is flowing in. Now, where we see challenges is on our customer's side to be able to supply us material. So uh, these plastic conduits, for example, there's, a, there's a, a nationwide shortage on plastic conduits. Everybody's hiding them in, in, in their backyard. Nobody wants to give them because they, you know, that's to them their prize jewel. Um, so every day we get orders from our customers and they can't supply us the conduit because they simply don't have availability of it. Mm -hmm. um, transformer pads what we call handholds, which are basically those plastic boxes you see in the ground where AT&T or Comcast connect into. Massive shortage for all of that type of material. So we've now managed to be able to gear ourselves up and have all of the resources we need to be successful. And now our challenge is helping our customers to find sources of material that they need to provide to us to keep us, uh, to keep us moving forward. So quite interesting. Well, you know, if I go back into your career, you were the fix-it guy. You were the guy who loved challenges. You took them on. You solved them for your big corporation you work for. And I always try to tell the people that I work with, uh, you're a CEO or you're seniors VP or whatever high-level executive solving problems for your corporation. Uh, and here you are. You got your own company. And guess what? You get to solve problems for yourself. Exactly. <laughs> and the talent comes to pay off. That's fantastic. So let's talk about Florida, just because I know it's it's a hot topic today. Maybe a lot of our listeners are from Florida or have family down there. Um, you said this is this is a, 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 this is exactly right up your alley. You, you, the, well, your it is, and you know, one of the when we first prospected the business, when I first said, "Okay, we're going to do this. Let's get into directional drilling," we kind of followed the line of communications because there was all this talk, you know, twenty twenty one about expanding broadband, expanding the fiber network. You know, they wanted to do last mile communication. So 
you know, that house way down the, the, you know, the farm road, they wanted to connect them to fiber. And it was really exciting. And everybody was talking about fiber. Google was setting up their own, you know, independent fiber network, Verizon, everybody wanted to do fiber, fiber. And uh, we started to drill for fiber. And we had fun doing it. It was good. You know, it was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of volume, but there was very little um, value in that business because so many companies were in it and doing it. The customer base was always challenging us on trying to be more efficient to try to give us a lower price because it was huge volumes. And we thought, yeah, that's good, but it's not sexy. It's not exciting. So we started to look around and say, hey, you know, we want a USP. We want to get ourselves into a space that others can't do or they can't do it well, let's say. And being in Florida was the perfect opportunity for us to do that because a lot of investment is coming in, continues to come in because of the hurricanes. You know, like Ian is a perfect example of that on the West Coast where you have a severe storm and typically what happens is all of the overhead cable gets destroyed. So, you know, it's not a new thing for South Florida, but I must say over the last 10 years, it's really becoming a new investment for the governments to be able to sell themselves, not only for the state governments, but also for the counties, for the cities the, to sell to their customer base to their residents that we are a community that has undergrounded all of our utilities. So those communities that no longer have overhead cables, everybody wants to go and live in those communities because they feel that they're much safer. It's inevitable the weather is going to come. It's just a matter of time. So it's a ticking time bomb when you're going to be out of power. The communities that are already undergrounded, they have a lot less risk. So you know, we just, one of our largest projects that uh, we started several months ago was to do a complete underground conversion in a very affluent area in Fort Lauderdale. It's called Las Olas Isles. Um, Multi-million dollar homes. Uh, there's over 400 homes within the community. And it's a pilot project for the city of Fort Lauderdale where they took the initiative to go to the residents and say, look, you're, you have overhead cables here. Um, all of your power, all of your communications is overhead. It's not nice. It doesn't look good, number one. But number two, the next severe storm that comes through this community, you guys are all going to be out of power again. So what the city proposed to them is that they would do the engineering. They would do the investment in converting all of the overhead to underground. Um, and they would charge the residents back through their taxes to pay for it. Mm -hmm. So they had, you know, town hall, blah, blah, blah. And they, the residents agreed. They said, yeah, that makes sense. So we were awarded the project to do that conversion. Um, and basically we're putting uh, multiple conduits in the ground so that our customers can push all of those overhead cables underground, AT&T, Comcast, Florida Power and Light, Crown Castle, whatever is there that exists today is now being pushed underground. And it continues. You know, there's areas where the city is investing. There's areas where the state is investing. There's even areas, for example, in West Palm Beach, where FEMA themselves have offered funding to, to do this type of undergrounding. Um, so that's where really where our focus is today. Our focus today is doing undergrounding conversions where we're putting multiple conduits down underground at one time. You know, just as a layman, I'm, we were talking before the show, I'm watching Hurricane Ian, that we all can see those power lines that are being falling over. And now when I have this or this vision, I think of you, it's, it's like Danny needs to be out there putting that stuff underground. So uh, uh, I can see that I can visually see the need. Well, Danny, this has been a fun conversation. Uh, again, uh, I never know the topics, but your topic is very unique. I love your story about how you got into business. I love how you persevered through like COVID and how you adapted, re-engineered, reinvented, uh, found sweet spots. You know, uh, that's just a wonderful journey for an owner. And uh, and I know it doesn't come without hard work, but I can see in your face it comes with a lot of satisfaction. I really appreciate the opportunity to tell my story, Rich, and uh, it's been great reconnecting with you again, and uh, I hope your audience finds uh, finds my story interesting. I'm sure they will. Thank you, Danny, and I will be talking to you soon, I'm sure. I appreciate it. Take care, Rich. 
Rich LeBrun here. Thank you so much for listening to our podcast, Get It Done Entrepreneurs. If you are a successful business owner who would like to be on this program, please visit us at rlebrun.com forward slash podcast and fill out the form and we will reach out to you. If you got something out of this interview, would you share this episode on social media? Just do a quick screenshot with your phone and text it to a friend or post it on the socials. If you know someone that would be a great guest, tag them on social media to let them know about the show and include the hashtag Get It Done Entrepreneurs. I love seeing your posts and guest suggestions. We are regularly putting out new episodes and content. To make sure you don't miss any episodes, go ahead and subscribe. Your thumbs up ratings and reviews go a long way to help promote the show and mean a lot to me and my team. Want to know more? Go to our website, rlebrun.com, or follow me on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. Thanks for listening. We will see you next time.